All right, thanks. So uh, tonight's lesson, um, this was uh, inspired off of the, or because of the lesson that we, we I just taught, I think two weeks ago for the Young Men's Ministry. The Young Men's Ministry, we basically went over instructions of a father, and it was all lessons that were taken from the wisdom of Syrah. Um Believe that that was, again, very well received. But when I went back and thought of, thought about it, obviously that was to the young men. But we all are children of the Most High. We are all children of our forefathers. And just how Syrah gave instructions to his uh, his son that were very wise words of instruction, the patriarchs, they left us instructions, and that is in the 12 patriarchs. So my goal and focus for today is to go through the 12 patriarchs, and I pulled out specifically 10 topics or 10 lessons um, that I believe that our patriarchs or our fathers were trying to portray in their teachings, in their letters that were written for our ammunition, for, for our edification, for our learning. And just as something that I stated to the young men's ministry, it's one thing for a father to teach uh, and give the instruction, but it's another thing for the, the, the child, which is us in this case, to receive the edification and to actually learn from it. So that's what I encourage all of us to do today is not just hear the instructions uh, that were taught, that you know, we can read about, but to actually learn from them. And to learn from them means that we need to practice and uh, experience and go through and exercise these things ourselves. So the name of tonight's lesson is going to be called Instructions of the Patriarchs, Warnings, and Orders. Again, the name of tonight's lesson is called Instructions of the Patriarchs, Warnings, and Orders. All right. So again, all of these precepts are all going to be coming from the book of the 12 patriarchs, uh, preferably the translation that is written by R.H. Charles. All right. And we're going to go uh, over the first topic is beware of fornication. So that's going to be the first topic that we're going to be getting predominantly from the book of Reuben. Now, all of these different topics um, multiple different patriarchs talked about them, but each individual uh, patriarch really, really tried to hit home on specific things. And these were typically were either warnings or instructions that they learned or because they went through this thing a lot themselves. And obviously, we, the best way to learn is from experience. But if our patriarchs, if our forefathers struggled through certain things, we don't have to go through those same hurdles if we learn from their lessons. All right, so the first scripture is coming from the book of the Testament, excuse me, the Testament of Reuben, chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. Again, first precept right. coming from the Testament of Reuben, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Uh, this is the Testament of Reuben, chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Beware, therefore, of fornication. And if you wish to be pure in mind, guard your senses from every woman, and command the woman, or women, rather, likewise not to associate with men, that they also may be pure in mind. Okay. So the first warning that we're going to learn about tonight is fornication. It makes sense that that's the first one because, Lord have mercy, that is definitely one of the strongest trials for all of us to stay away from. So that's definitely a, a, a big warning. So fornication, we know, is any um, any unsanctioned uh, sexual act, right? A anything that is any sexual act that is taken outside of the confines of a marriage between man and woman, right? So, again, the word beware, it's a warning. It's, it's an alert. It's like this is something that we need to be cautious about. We, the way that we can pre prepare ourselves to be cautious about this is staying pure in mind and guarding ourselves. And we need to guard ourselves. Uh, men need to guard ourselves from women. But likewise, women can need to guard themselves uh, 
from from men as well. And again, we're going to see throughout the, the whole testament here. Um, actually, I don't want to put the cart before the horse because I think we are going to get into that scripture. So I'm gonna hold that. Um, let's say in the again Reuben. We're gonna to go to the book of Reuben, chapter two, verses eight through nine. And most I willing due to time. I'm not going to do a lot of extra elaborating. I think that the scriptures speak very well for themselves and the way that they're laid out. So we're going to get these topics and these precepts that are explaining the purpose of these topics. So again, we're talking about warning or staying away from fornication. The book or Testament of Reuben, chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. This is the Testament of Reuben, chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. The seventh is the power of procreation and sexual intercourse, with which through love of pleasure sins enter in. Wherefore, it is the last in order of creation, and the first in that of youth, because it is filled with ignorance, and leadeth the youth as a blind man to a pit, and as a beast to a precipice. Ah. So here, Reuben, he was explaining all of the senses that man was given since birth. And with all these senses, there were specific spirits that were meant to utilize to attack the sons of Adam through these senses. And it says that the seventh spirit or the seventh power was through, was procreation. Again, we understand that that is the action of bringing forth children, which we understand that comes, like the scripture just said, from sexual intercourse. And that is also where the love of pleasure enters in. So we're being warned about that pleasure here in the Testament of Reuben. But it uh, says that this was the last um, spirit that came in th with creation. Even though it was the last in order of being created, it is the first one that attacked man in our youth. Why? Because in our youth, we're very ignorant. We don't have a lot of knowledge and understanding. We haven't learned how to restrain or refrain from certain things. And it's through that ignorance that man is really easy to fall in into that pleasure, which leads into fornication. All right, let's go to the next testament, chapter 4, verse 1. Testament of Reuben, chapter 4, verse 1. Pay no heed, therefore, my children, to the beauty of women nor set your mind on their affairs, but walk in singleness of heart in the fear of the Lord, and expend labor on good works and on study and on your flocks, until the Lord give you a wife whom he will, that ye suffer not as I did. Ah. So here we see Reuben as what he's, again, giving his sons a warning. They're saying, he's saying, look, pay no attention to the beauty of a woman. We shouldn't, that should not be the driving focus uh, or attention for obtaining a wife in the first place. It should not be her looks. And obviously, we're talking, this is scripture specifically talking about the beauty of a woman, but the same thing goes for women and them looking upon the the handsomeness of a man, right? The, the, the outward appearance is not what someone should be striving to look out for when they're searching for a spouse. And instead, we need to have singleness of, of heart and fear of the Most High and just concentrate on him and our works. And if we're concentrating on the Most High and our works and just being righteous, then the Most High, if he wills it, he will put the right man or woman in, our, in, in front of us where it will, it will be easily known that that person was sent from the Most High to be a, a spouse for you instead of searching out, trying to fill out, fulfill your own lust or your own pleasures and seeking a wife just for the purpose of fornication. Or, uh, well, excuse me, seeking the seeking a spouse just for the purpose of trying to fulfill the lust of your flesh. Mm. Huh. All right, the next, test, the next testament is coming from, the, again, the Testament of Reuben, chapter mm. 4, verses 6 through 7. Testament of Reuben, chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. For a pit unto the soul is the sin of fornication, separating mm -hmm. it from the Most High. 
and bringing it near to idols, because it deceiveth the mind and understanding, and leadeth young men into Hades before their time. For many have fornication destroyed, because though a man be old or noble or rich or poor, he bringeth reproach upon himself with the sons of men, and derision with Belier. Mm-hmm. So this is showing it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a young person, if you're an old person, if you're rich, if you're poor, if you, if you have substance, if, you, if you're married or if you're single. The sin of fornication can, can capture anyone that loses focus. And when you get mm-hmm. captured in this sin of fornication, it says it's, it, it's a pit. It's a deep, dark hole. And this mm. deep, dark hole separates you from the most high. Because we mm. understand what in, 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 a, in a pit, there's what? There's, there's no light. It's pure darkness. And that's what this scripture is comparing fornication to. It's comparing it to a, a deep, dark place where the most high cannot dwell, where the Holy Spirit cannot dwell. So if we're living our lives in the, in the sin of fornication, it's also linking it to being similar to what? To idolatry. Right, it's idolatry because typically, if if someone is dealing with idolatry, they're what they're they're worshiping something that is not the Most High. A lot of times, people that are stuck in the sin of fornication, they end up worshiping their the lust of their flesh. They're putting all of their efforts, all of their attention, all of their energy into that sin instead of devoting it to the Most High. Mm-hmm. And again, because of this, many men and women have been led astray. To the pits of hell and to to belly off. Mm. So again, this is the first um, warning that's specifically being brought out from the Testament of Reuben. If you read through all the Testament of Reuben, he's hitting a lot on beware of fornication. So that's the first topic. Mm. The next topic is going to beware of jealousy, envy, and deceit. Okay, so this is warning number two. Warning number two is beware of the spirit of jealousy, envy, and deceit. And we're going to see that jealousy, envy, and deceit, they all work together. All of these three different spirits work together for the same purpose. And we're going to get this understanding. We're going to go to the uh, Testament of Simeon. The Testament of Simeon, chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through four. This is the Testament of Simeon, chapter three, beginning at verse one through four. And now, my children, hearken unto me and beware of the spirit of deceit and envy. For envy ruleth over the whole mind of a man and suffereth him neither to eat nor drink nor do any good thing. But it ever suggesteth to him to destroy him that he envieth. And so long as he that is envied flourisheth, he that envieth fadeth away. Two years, therefore, I afflicted my soul with fasting in the fear of the Lord. And I learnt that deliverance from envy cometh by the fear of the Most High. God. So we see here that um, throughout the book of Simeon, he's speaking a lot about the spirit of deceit and envy. When you read the, the, his story, his, 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 uh, his testament, Simeon was a very proud man. And it was through that pride that, what, that, that the spirit of jealousy, envy, and deceit was able to come in. And the scripture is letting us know that when that spirit comes in, that it, it takes over your whole mind. When, whenever you, there's someone that you're jealous against or you're envious again, or you you start lying around that individual because you want to try to make yourself look better, or you're lying on that individual to make that person look bad. So that's what I meant by these these spirits work in tandem or together. Because typically, if you're jealous or envious of someone, you're going to end up lying to either hide that jealousy or envy, or to end up shaming that individual. And again, these when if you have that spirit on you, it, it's so bad of a spirit, it makes you lose your appetite or, or, or it makes you 
continuously be in a state of, of, of thirst. Is why because you're all you're doing is focusing on that you know, on that one thing. All right, let's continue. Staying in the Testament of Simeon, chapter two, verses six through seven. And again, I just want to forgot to mention this part, Salakia, that Simeon, even though that this is a very strong spirit and they work together, he also stated that the way to overcome that spirit is through fasting and through having a fear of the Most High. So regardless of how strong that these spirits or these entities are, there's always a deliverance. And that deliverance is always in trusting and fearing the Most High. All right, so again, let's move on to the Testament of Simeon, chapter two, verses six through seven. Testament of Simeon, chapter two, verses six through seven. For in the time of my youth, I was jealous in many things of Joseph, because my father loved him beyond all. And I set my mind against him to destroy him, because the prince of deceit sent forth the spirit of jealousy and blinded my mind, so that I regarded him not as a brother, nor did I spare even Jacob, my father. Got him. So again, showing you that these spirits work together. First, the first thing that set in was jealousy. And again, jealousy can happen for, for, for many different reasons. If you see somebody else doing good um, and, and you feel like that you should have that glory, you should have reward, it, it's very, you have to be cautious of that. Because if you're seeing someone else um, in, a, in, a, in a good light and you feel like that you should be that way, that's where the spirit of jealousy is seeping in. And it's even also have to be cautious to make sure that the spirit of jealousy doesn't come on other people by promoting yourself. If you do, if you are someone that's doing good or you're, you've been given a good reward, that's not something to boast about because it can make someone else become jealous of you. And again, that's, that's only adding sin upon sin. But again, this is showing again that jealousy does not work alone. It says that the prince of deceit sent the spirit of jealousy. Why? For the purpose of blinding someone's mind. Because once that, that spirit is on you, you start to see people not as who they really are, but you start seeing them as an enemy. And that's what we don't want to do. We're supposed to understand that people are within in our body, but we should treat everyone with a level of love and respect, but especially those of, of the fold, those of the faith. You know, the, our, our brother or sister in Christ. And here, Simeon even said that it was his his brother as well as his father. He had no respect of them. His mind was blinded through what? Through the spirit of jealousy. Next, let's go to the Testament of Simeon, chapter 4. We're going to read verses 8 through 9. And this is going to be talking about the evil of envy. So again, the book of Testament of Simeon, chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. Testament of Simeon, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. For this maketh savage the soul, and destroyeth the body. It causeth anger and war in the mind, and stirreth up unto deeds of blood, and leadeth the mind into frenzy, and suffereth not prudence to act in men. Moreover, it taketh away sleep, and causeth tumult to the soul, and trembling to the body. For even in sleep some malicious jealousy, deluding him, gnaweth, and with wicked spirits disturbeth his soul, and causeth the body to be troubled, and waketh the mind from sleep in confusion. And as a wicked and poisonous spirit, so appeareth it to men. Mm. Telling you, boy, that, that spirit of envy is is so heavy that it's one of those spirits that you can, you can't even hide. Mm. It, it, when you see someone that is it, that has that spirit of envy or jealousy on them, they don't they it's so hard that they don't want anything to do with that person that they have that spirit against, right? Because it's 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 destroying them. They start shaking. They they can't look at that person in their eye. Like I said, they they end up losing sleep. So now because you're losing sleep, you're not rested. You're constantly in, in, in a disturbed state, right? And it's, it's gnawing at you constantly. 
even it's usually mm-hmm. even to the point where people that are really struggling with that, they don't even know why they're jealous or envious. They just start hating on somebody just just because. Mm-hmm. Not even mm-hmm. being able to identify what the root of the issue is. Which again, mm-hmm. the root of the issue is a spirit that's affecting you. And it's mm-hmm. giving you an evil eye towards someone because that individual did nothing to you anyway in the first place. Mm. So again, and even that word where it says it causes a tumult of the soul. A tumult is a war. So you're having a war in your soul because of a feeling of anger, which that's a whole nother one. We'll get into that. But of the spirit of envy that you've allowed to rise up in you. So again, what we're going through are warnings. So if you start, if you're starting to, if you see that you are coming across any of these spirits that they're dealing with you, you need to pray, possibly need to fast, and and find a way to get that get a release from that spirit. All right, the next topic. The next topic, um, this is beware of false teachers. Beware mm. of false teachers. Mm. This is going to be coming from the book, uh, or apologize, excuse me, the Testament of Levi, chapter mm. 13, verses 1 through 5. Again, we're on topic number three now. Coming from the Testament of Levi, chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Testament of Levi, chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. And now, my children, I command you, fear the Most High your power with your whole heart, and walk in simplicity according to all his law. And do ye also teach your children letters, that they may have understanding all their life reading unceasingly the law of the Most High. For everyone that knoweth the law of the Lord shall be honored, and shall not be a stranger whithersoever he goeth. Yea, many friends shall he gain more than his parents, and many men shall desire to serve him, and to hear the law from his mouth. Work righteousness, therefore, my children, upon the earth, that ye may have it as treasure in heaven. Ah. So the first portion of this is it's telling us to walk in simplicity according to all his law. The, again, you, I'm sure we have all heard people say, you know, there's over 600 laws. How can you keep them? But in actuality, keeping the most high laws are very simple. And when I say simple, I'm not saying that it's not going to be a struggle, especially being, you know, stuck here in Babylon, stuck in captivity. But when I say simplicity, I mean as far as understanding. Understanding the Most High's laws are simple. It, it, it's usually not a lot of big uh, breakdowns or trying to read through loopholes and trying to say, well, this means that and that means this. The scriptures explain themselves if we're reading unceasingly the law. The, 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 the times that understanding the Most High's law comes uh becomes confusing is because you're not reading it so if we're constantly staying in his word and 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 staying obedient and allowing the holy spirit to use us the understanding of his word becomes clear now Mm -hmm. obviously the scriptures state that it's uh the veil is over the eyes of the unrighteous so there are plenty of people that don't understand the law so I know that's kind of a catch-22 if it's saying that it's simple, but at the same time, it's some people don't understand it. The reason they don't understand it is because they're living in wickedness. But if you're someone that is living in righteousness and you're reading the scriptures on a regular basis, seeking understanding, then the Most High will reveal things to you in a simplistic manner. Uh, let's move on to the book of Levi, or excuse me, I'm saying the book, the Testament of Levi, chapter 17, verse 11. Testament of Levi, chapter 17, verse 11. And in the seventh week shall become priests who are idolaters, adulterers, lovers of money, proud, lawless, lascivious, 
abusers of children and beasts. Uh, so this, and within this context, Levi is explaining what's happening in the last days, in the last Jubilees, when it talks about the seven. It says during that time, that priests will be idolaters. And, and priests, he's, he's simply referring to teachers, those that claim to be upholders of God's law and his, 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 his testament, but they're living lives of wickedness. Now, this is obviously predominantly talking about the so-called first day uh, church pastors, right? A lot of them are idolaters, um, adulterers, you know, lovers of money. They're, they're doing whatever they can to, to, to keep their church, churches open. Or some of them are so filthy rich that they become prideful uh, and lawless, right? And, and, and they use their position to become abusers of the faith, right? So, again, this is what we're being warned about in the last days. We're being warned about false teachers. All right, staying in the book, uh, the Testament of Levi, let's read the Testament of Levi, chapter 14, verses 3 through 7. Testament of Levi, chapter 14, verses 3 through 7. For as the heaven is pure in the Lord's sight and the earth, so also be ye the lights of Israel, pure than all the Gentiles. But if ye be darkened through transgressions, what therefore will all the Gentiles do living in blindness? Yea, ye shall bring a curse upon our race, because the light of the law which was given for to lighten every man, this ye desire to destroy by teaching commandments contrary to the ordinances of the Most High. The offerings of the Lord ye shall rob, and from his portion shall ye steal choice portions eating them contemptuously with harlots. And out of covetousness, ye shall teach the commandments of the Most High. Wedded women shall ye pollute, and the virgins of Jerusalem shall ye defile. And with harlots and adulteresses shall ye be joined, and the daughters of the Gentiles shall ye take to wife, purifying them with an unlawful purification. And your union shall be like unto Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye shall be puffed up because of your priesthood, lifting yourselves up against men, and not only so, but also against the commands of the Most High. For ye shall contemn the holy things with jests and laughter. Man, this is this is a dangerous warning. Obviously, it's dangerous for, for those that are being taught, but it's even more dangerous for those that are in this position. So we, we see here that it's being talked about that in the, in the last days there will be teachers that what? That will be puffed up. And they'll be puffed up. Why? Because of the position that they're in. And they use that position to teach commandments that are contrary, which means in opposite or against the ordinance of the Most High. Again, which goes back into the first portion. The laws of the Most High are simple. So there should be no reason for false teachers to teach things that are contrary to the ordinances. And it says, for they shall what contemn the holy things, right? Contemn means to, to, uh, to, to, to laugh at or mock or, or to jest. So they're laughing at the, the laws and ordinance of the Most High. And again, through their covetousness, they, which is, again, them just wanting things, again, they use their position to deceitfully use and um manipulate the people to get their own will here on earth, but in their end, they're going to suffer in the same as Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, let's get the next topic. The next topic is another deep one. It's the topic of arrogance, drunkenness, fornication, and the love of money. So all of this is going to be coming from from uh, from one testament, coming from the testament of Judah. But again, the topic that he hits on a lot is arrogance, which is pride, drunkenness, and fornication, and the love of money. And again, we're going to see how all of these relate. They're all individually different, but again, all of these can relate. 
So let's go start with the uh, Testament of Judah, chapter 18, verses 2 through 4. Testament of Judah, chapter 18, verses 2 through 4. Beware, therefore, my children, of fornication and the love of money, and hearken to Judah, your father. For these things withdraw you from the law of the Most High, and blind the inclination of the soul, and teach arrogance, and suffer not a man to have compassion upon his neighbor. They rob his soul of all goodness, and oppress him with toils and troubles, and drive away sleep from him, and devour his flesh. Uh, and devour his flesh means it's eating them up. So again, as I've st stated this topic, um, it shows that what that both fornication and the love of money um, are two things that we're being warned about. But if someone falls into fornication and they fall into the love of money, it's through those t those two spirits that again someone can easily become arrogant. They become arrogant because of how many people that they've dealt with, right, in, in regards to an intimate level. They start feeling like, oh, well, hey, you know, I, I, I'm all that. You know, everybody likes me, right? They get start puffed up feeling themselves. Or through the love of the money, they obtain a lot of um, earthly wealth. Again, because of that earthly wealth, now what? They, again, become arrogant or prideful because of the physical things that they have. So now it was through their first um, physical lust that they attained something, and now a deeper spirit attaches on them to them, which is going to add, again add sin upon sin. All right. So let's say staying in the Testament of Judah. Let's read the Testament of Judah, chapter thirteen, verses two through three. The Testament of Judah, chapter 13, verses 2 through 3. This is the Testament of Judah, chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. And walk not after your lusts, nor in the imaginations of your thoughts in haughtiness of heart, and glory not in the deeds and strength of your youth. For this teacher. also is evil Black guy. in the eyes of the Lord. Very good. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, brother. Is that all right, other? We're gonna say things happen. Let's go ahead. Start back over from the top, there, brother. Uh, Testament of Judah, chapter thirteen, verses two and three. And walk not after your lusts, nor in the imaginations of your thoughts in haughtiness of heart, and glory not in the deeds and strength of your youth, for this also is evil in the eyes of the Lord, since I also gloried that in wars no comely woman's face ever entice me, and reproved Reuben, my brother, concerning Bilhah, the wife of my father. The spirits of jealousy and of fornication arrayed themselves against me, until I lay with Bathsheba, the Canaanite, and Tamar, who was espoused to my sons. Uh, so again, uh, this is, again, our forefather Judah, right? He's saying that what? We need to beware of our lust in the imagination of our thoughts, right? And haughtiness, again, haughtiness is another word meaning pridefulness or arrogance. And again, why did Judah, why did he suffer from this? Because he used to glory in the deeds of his strength. We know that he was one of the strongest. And in his days, he was doing things that a lot of his brothers, you know, weren't doing or he was doing it at a higher level as far as physically, as far as his strength. And he became prideful. And early on in his, in his, his youth, Women were, were not, they did not entice him, right? So he wasn't phased by the beauty of women. So then when his brother, uh, Reuben, fell to his lust, Judah started mocking him, or not, not mocking him, excuse me, reproving him. But again, this is even why we need to be cautious in our rebuke so that we also don't fall subject to sin. Because just how, how easily we can re rebuke others for falling to sin, we have to be mindful that, again, all of us are susceptible. And that's exactly what happened to Judah. 
You know, he, he spent a lot of time re- rebuking Reuben, and then the same thing he rebuked Reuben for, he fell into himself, the spirit of fornication and jealousy, right? All right, let's stay with Judah, the Testament, uh, Judah chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Testament of Judah, chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. And now I command you, my children, not to love money, nor to gaze upon the beauty of women, because for the sake of money and beauty, I was led astray to Bathsheba the Canaanite. For I know that because of these two things shall my race fall into wickedness. Uh, so Judah said it plainly. And again, if you if you look at Judah, the so-called Negro today, you can easily see that this is one of our two biggest uh, hurdles, the love of money and fornication. And he stated, he said, like, look, these two things will be the fall of his, of his race, these two things. So that's, again, we're learning the things that we were told that we need to be aware of, to a warning to stay away from, the love of money and the beauty of women or fornication. All right, let's say two more in the Testament of Judah. Let's go to Judah chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Because as I'm getting earlier, I mentioned there were four, right? So, so far we've spoken a lot about arrogance, fornication, and the love of money. But what about the drunkenness? How does that play into this? Let's go again, Testament of Judah, chapter 14, verses 1 and 3, or 1 through 3, excuse me. Testament of Judah, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And now, my children, I say unto you, Be not drunk with wine, for wine turneth the mind away from the truth, and inspires the passion of lust, and leadeth the eyes into error. For the spirit of fornication hath wine as a minister to give pleasure to the mind. For these two also take away the mind of man. For if a man drink wine to drunkenness, it disturbeth the mind with filthy thoughts leading to fornication, and heedeth the body to carnal union. And if the occasion of the lust be present, He worketh the sin and is not ashamed. And that's the scariest part, and is not ashamed. So, again, what is the the, the point that Judah is talking about right right here? He's talking about be not drunk with wine. Because, again, as we mentioned earlier on, Judah, in his earlier years, he was not enticed by the face of women. So he wasn't, fornication wasn't something that he had to deal with. He wasn't concerned about until he started drinking until he got drunk. Once he got drunk, that's when the spirit of fornication was able to enter in and started to deal with his mind. It started to minister to him, right? That's what allowed him to be disturbed and then start thinking about filthy thoughts. And then because, again, his his mind is now tainted, his guard is let down, he was able to slip and fall, right? So, again, this is a warning. Even if you're someone that does not um, struggle with fornication, you can still be led or persuaded down that road if you're put in a state of drunkenness. So, again, that's the caution. The caution. All right. Um, Testament of Judah chapter 16. Read verses 1 through 3. Right? So, again, even in, in our worldly terms, right, we hear about what if, what do they call it, liquid courage, right? If someone is is too uh, shy, you know, to approach someone of the opposite sex, they'll say, well, no, just get a couple of drinks in them, get a couple of drinks in them, right? Why? It's because their mind is disturbed and they're able, more easily susceptible to think about filthy thoughts because of the drunkenness. So, again, this is the warning that we're supposed to stay away from. Testament, uh, Judah chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Testament of Judah, chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Observe, therefore, my children, the right limit in wine. For there are in it four evil spirits of lust, of hot desire, of profligacy, of filthy lucre. If you drink wine in gladness, Be ye modest in the fear of the Most High. 
For if in your gladness the fear of the Most High departeth, then drunkenness ariseth, and shamelessness stilleth it. But if ye would live soberly, do not touch wine at all, lest ye sin in words of outrage, and in fightings, and slanders, and transgressions of the commandments of the Most High, and ye perish before your time. Come. So it even says that what through the, the overuse of wine, so again, I'm, I'm not stating that it's wrong to, to consume wine or to consume alcohol. It's talking about the uh, overuse of it to the point of drunkenness, right? That can lead a man to what? To, to perish before his time. And again, as we see here, it outright says that wine it deal, has four spirits that deal with it, right? Just in becoming drunk, you're automatically opening yourself up to an additional four spirits of lust, hot desire, uh, profligacy, and filthy lucre, right? So the lust, that's what? That's talking about your, your, your pleasures, right? That's the, the pleasure of the fornication, the, the hot desire. So that can be uh, any strong feeling or emotion. So that can be arrogance. That can be pride, right? That, that's any strong emotion. And then that profligacy, that's what? An extravagant, uh, wasteful use, right? And it's usually in terms of of intimacy, right? Or having just a, a reckless behavior when it comes to just uh, being immodest, right? And then the filthy lucre, again, is talking about the love of money. So, again, the Testament is t saying clearly that all four of these things deal together with themselves. So, again, this one was arrogance, drunkenness, fornication, and the love of money. Let's move on to the fifth topic, the topic of anger and lying. All right, so the fifth topic or the fifth warning to be aware of is anger and lying. For this, we're going to go to the Testament of Dan. The Testament of Dan, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Testament of Dan, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And now, my children, behold, I am dying. I tell you of a truth, that unless ye keep yourselves from the spirit of lying and of anger, and love truth and long suffering, ye shall perish. For anger is blindness, and does not suffer one to see the face of any man with truth. For though it be a father or a mother, he behaveth towards them as enemies. Though it be a brother, he knoweth him not. Though it be a prophet of the Most High, he disobeyeth him. Though a righteous man, he regardeth him not. Though a friend, he doeth not acknowledge him. For the spirit of anger encompasseth him with the net of deceit and blindeth his eyes, and through lying darkeneth his mind, and giveth him its own peculiar vision. Mm -hmm. So it says that the spirit of anger will give someone their own peculiar vision, right? We've all, again, probably heard this, this saying. But man, they, they made me so angry I can't see straight, right? So where does that come from? That's coming from, from this same understanding. If you allow yourself to get so angered, so enraged, it, it clouds, it, it blinds you. That's what the scripture says. It blinds you so that you can't, you literally can't see straight. You're seeing red. You're seeing evil. You're seeing vengeance. And again, through that spirit of anger, it's easy to start lying, right? Because you're either lying trying to hide that anger or you're lying on that individual that you were angry with, right? And it's also lying because there's a spirit that's lying to you giving you false information about what you're seeing. So sometimes the spirit of lying isn't necessarily you are lying. It's the lying of the spirit that's telling you things. Like, hey, this, that brother doesn't like you. That's a lie. That, that was the spirit of lying that gave you that false information. Hey, that sister said uh, that, you know, you, you dress immodestly or, again, anything, right? So we have to be very cautious about controlling what our tempers so that way we are not caught in this net of deceit or lying, which causes us to have a, a, an obscured vision. All right, let's stay in the Testament of Dan, chapter 1, 
verses 3 through 8. Testament of Dan, chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. I have proved in my heart and in my whole life that truth with just dealing is good and well-pleasing to the Most High, and that lying and anger are evil because they teach man all wickedness. I confess, therefore, this day to you, my children, that in my heart I resolved on the death of Joseph, my brother, the true and good man. And I rejoiced that he was sold because his father loved him more than us. For the spirit of jealousy and vain glory said to me, Thou thyself also art his son. And one of the spirits of Belier stirred me up, saying, Take this sword, and with it slay Joseph. So shall thy father love thee when he is dead. Now this is the spirit of anger that persuaded me to crush Joseph as a leopard crusheth a kid. Mm. Man, so look, we see what th these spirits talk to us, right? These spirits stir things up in us. So it was the spirit of anger that a lot, that spoke to Dan and said, what, go, go kill your brother, go slay your brother, right? But even still with that spirit, he didn't come along, come alone. That spirit came in or entered in how? What? First through the spirit of jealousy and vainglory. So, again, it's showing that all of these spirits work together to accomplish the goal of tearing man down, which is why it's very important for us to stay cautious and be aware of all of them so that we, we know what to look for in ourselves so that way we can be protected and stay away from sin. All right. Last one from Dan, Testament of Dan, chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. Testament of Dan. Chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. If ye fall into any loss or ruin, my children, be not afflicted, for this very spirit maketh a man desire that which is perishable, in order that he may be enraged through the affliction. And if ye suffer loss voluntarily or involuntarily, be not vexed. For from vexation arise of wrath with lying. Moreover, a twofold mischief is wrath with lying. And they assist one another in order to disturb the heart. And when the soul is continually disturbed, the Lord departeth from it, and Belier ruleth over it. Mm. So again, it's showing that what? That these spirits assist one another, which means they're working together, right? Again, they, they have a purpose to what? To destroy man's heart or a man's mind, right? And they're doing that so that 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 individual will be it's lost in so much wickedness that the Most High has to depart from them, that the Holy Spirit has to depart from you. And when the Holy Spirit leaves and you're on your own, the Most High is not dealing with you, now that's just giving Satan a chance to what? Rule over your body, rule over your members. Now Satan can do what he wants with you and then use you to affect others. This is why it's important, again, for us to, to what the Scripture says, or the Testament says, what, to not be afflicted to not be vexed. Don't allow other people to affect you in a negative manner. And again, I know that's something that's easier said than done. But again, these are the warnings that we need to that the scriptures are warning us about. Beware of them, these things. Beware if, if someone says something to you and it, it makes you angry or makes you sad or not sad, excuse me, upset. You need to find a way to quickly resolve that vexation. That that affliction, because if it's left unresolved, that's when that spirit of anger and wrath is going to sneak in and bring other spirits with it to tear you down or to tear another individual down. All right. The sixth topic. This is the topic of hatred. Very similar. The topic of hatred. We're going to go to the Testament of Gad. Testament of Gad, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Testament of Gad, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Beware, therefore, my children, of hatred, for it worketh lawlessness 
even against the Most High himself, where it will not hear the words of his commandments concerning the loving of one's neighbor, and it sinneth against the Most High. For if a brother stumble, it delighteth immediately to proclaim it to all men, and it's urgent that he should be judged for it, and be punished, and be put to death. And if it be a servant, it stirreth him up against his master, and with every affliction it deviseth against him, if possibly he can be put to death. For hatred worketh with envy, also against them that prosper, so long as it heareth of or seeth their success, it always languisheth. For as love would quicken even the dead, and would call back them that are condemned to die, so hatred would slay the living, and those that had sinned venually, it would not suffer to live. For the spirit of hatred worketh together with Satan, through hastiness of spirit, and all things to men's death. But the spirit of love worketh together with the law of the Most High, and long suffering unto the salvation of men. Ah. Thank you, brother. Great reading. So this this spirit of of hatred again, they it works together with what with envy, which is jealousy, and it's very similar to anger. But the the key point about hatred is that those that deal or deal with this spirit of hatred, they want they're quick to seek out judgment, right? If, if if somebody hates someone and they see someone fall or uh, be tempted, they're quick to want that person to, to, to fall or, or to, re- to receive some type of punishment for their actions, right? It's because they just, they, they for whatever reason, they, they love seeing somebody else fall. And the opposite of that is that the scriptures tells us what? That we need to be long-suffering, right? We need to be patient. So if you're someone that is very hot mannered, hot tempered, and you're you're quick to judge, being quick to judge is linked very, very much so to the spirit of hatred. All right, the next precept, staying in the Testament of Gad, chapter five, verses one through five. Testament of Gad, chapter five, verses one through five. Hatred, therefore, is evil, for it constantly mateth with lying, speaking against the truth, and it maketh small things to be great, and causeth the light to be darkness, and calleth the sweet bitter, and teacheth slander, and kindleth wrath, and stirreth up war and violence, and all covetousness. It filleth the heart with evils and devilish poison. These things, therefore, I say to you from experience, my children, that ye may drive forth hatred, which is of the devil, and cleave to the love of the Most High. Righteousness casteth out hatred, humility destroyeth envy. For he that is just and humble is ashamed to do what is unjust, being reproved not of another, but of his own heart, because the Most High looketh on his inclination. He speaketh not against a holy man, because the fear of the Most High overcometh hatred. For fearing, lest he should offend the Most High, he will not do wrong to any man, even in thought. Uh, so again, we see two two points. Well, there's a, many points. Um, but one, that hatred is working together with what? With lying. To, to, to cause, again, all of these different sins or offenses, right? trying to find a, a way to make someone else stumble, right? But uh, we also see the resolve or the answer for this fear is what? Just simply fearing the most high. If I fear the most high, I'm not going to be quick to judge someone. I'm not going to be quick to hate someone because I understand that the same level of judgment that I'm seeking to have on someone else, I can expect that the most high will have that same judgment with me. So that would then incline me to what? To be patient with others, to, to not lie on others, right? So that way we're, I'm, we're hoping that in the day of judgment that the most I will be patient with us. All right, last one for the Testament of Gad. Testament of Gad, chapter 6, 
verses 1 through 4. Testament of Gad, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And now, my children, I exhort you, love ye each one his brother, and put away hatred from your hearts. Love one another in deed and in word, and in the inclination of the soul. For in the presence of my father I spake peaceably to Joseph. When I had gone out, the spirit of hatred darkened my mind, and stirred up my soul to slay him. Love ye therefore one another from the heart, and if a man sin against thee, cast forth the poison of hate, and speak peaceably to him, and in thy soul hold not guile. And if he confess and repent, forgive him. But if he deny it, do not get into a passion with him, lest catching the poison from thee he take to swearing, and so thou sin doubly. Ah. So again, with that spirit of, of hatred, we're also called to not to not hold guile, right? So th that means to, because again, you're you're normally holding on to hatred. Someone that's holding on to hatred is because they're normally seeking vengeance, right? And when if you're seeking vengeance, you're not opening up the opportunity or the possibility for that person to repent, which means you're shutting off the door of forgiveness, right? But instead, again, we should be quick to forgive, right? Because if, if we're not able to forgive, then, again, that's how that door is open for that same sin or fault that uh, someone else might be, be dealing with. If we're not patient with them, it's possible that that same sin can then be on us. So, again, we need to be cautious and be aware of this spirit of hatred. All right? So I just want to recap. So we went over six topics so far, and all of these topics have been warnings or things to be aware of, to beware of. So the first one was in the Testament of Reuben, warning about the spirit of fornication. In the Testament of Simeon, we were warned about the spirit of jealousy, envy, and deceit. In the Testament of Levi, we're warned to be aware of false teachers. In the Testament of Judah, we're being warned about arrogance, drunkenness, fornication, and the love of money. In the Testament of Dan, we're being warned about the spirit of anger and lying. In the Testament of Gad, we're being warned about the spirit of hatred. So not all instructions that our fathers give are things to stay away from, but we also are given instructions of things to do, right? So these are, these are orders. So we've already been told specifically, hey, be aware of this, stay away from this. But now we're going to get on the good side. What things should we be leaning toward? What attributes should we be having? So the first topic, um, so this is topic number seven. This is we need to understand and keep the most high order. So again, we need to understand and keep the most high order. Now we're going to go to the Testament of Naphtali, chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Testament of Naphtali, chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Sun and moon and stars change not their order. So do ye also change not the law of the Most High in the disorderliness of your doings. The Gentiles went astray and forsook the Most High and changed their order and obeyed stocks and stones, spirits of deceit. But ye shall not be so. My children, recognizing in the firmament, in the earth, and in the sea, and in all created things, the Most High who made all things, that ye become not as Sodom, which changed the order of nature. In like manner, the watchers also changed the order of their nature, whom the Most High cursed at the flood, on whose account he made the earth without inhabitants and fruitless. God. 
So again, we're being instructed to what? To not change the law of God, not change the, the order that the most high set in place, right? Because in doing so, or let me rephrase that, the spirit of deceit is what allows people to what? To feel like that they can do that. If someone feels like they can change the, the laws or the order of nature that the most high put in place, it's because the spirit of deceit has lied to them and deceived them and, and making them believe that it was okay to do so. Because again, the laws of the most high are simple. It should be simple to see that man belongs with woman and woman belongs with man. You, you're, you're deceived in your mind if you believe that it's all right for a man to be with a man or, vice, or, or for a woman to be with a woman, right? That's going against the nature or the order of things, right? You, it should be easy to believe that a creature of a certain kind should be with a creature with a certain kind, right? It, uh, it doesn't make sense for a, a dog to mate with a cat, right, or anything of that nature. Or the scripture here that's talking about that an angel should not be what, with man. That should be a simple thing to understand. But yet, if someone believes that it's okay to mix and splice uh, species or, or kind with kind, that's, again, because they've been deceived in the mind to make you believe something that goes against nature. All right, let's stay in the Testament of Naphtali, chapter 8, verses 7 through 10. Testament of Naphtali, chapter 8, verses 7 through 10. For the commandments of the law are twofold, and through prudence must they be fulfilled. For there is a season for a man to embrace his wife, and a season to abstain therefrom for his prayer. So then, there are two commandments, and unless they be done in due order, they bring very great sin upon men. So also it is with the other commandments. Be ye therefore wise in the Most High, my children, and prudent, understanding the order of his commandments and the laws of every word that the Most High may love you. Uh -huh. So the first example, when we're talking about the disorder of, we're using examples of Sodom and Gomorrah and the watchers, right? That's an easy example. But there are even good things that can be done out of order. And those good things that are done out of order are, end up, those things can be become sinful, can become sinful, excuse me. So it's only through what? We have to be very cautious with our liberty, right? We have to be very, very cautious with our liberty because sometimes doing things that we have the liberty to do at the wrong time can become sinful. So this is what the scripture is, is, is warning us from. We need to ha have a, a fervent understanding of his law, of his commandments. So this is, again, the topic of understanding what his law and his order is. All right, let's move on. Topic number eight, almost done, safe, only going to do 10 of them. Topic number eight is show mercy and have compassion. So the instruction is that we need to show mercy and we need to have compassion. We're going to get this going to the Testament of Zebulun, chapter five, verses one through three. Uh, Testament of Zebulun, chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. And now, my children, I bid you to keep the commands of the Most High, and to show mercy to your neighbors, and to have compassion towards all, not towards men only, but also towards beasts. For all this thing's sake, the Most High bless me. And when all my brethren were sick, I escaped without sickness, for the Most High knoweth the purposes of each. Have, therefore, compassion in your hearts, my children, because even as a man doeth to his neighbor, even so also will the Most High do to him. Uh, so just like I mentioned earlier, you know, the same level of compassion that we have with others is the same type of compassion that we can expect for the Most High to have with us, right? 
or, or, or mercy, right? So we need to have mercy and compassion, but not just against men, but it even says against beasts, right? We shouldn't be going out there and just killing livestock or animals just for no reason, right? Or, or, or harming creatures, right? Because that's not showing a level of compassion. All right, staying in the Testament of Zebulun, let's go to the Testament of Zebulun, chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Testament of Zebulun, chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Do you, therefore, my children, from that which the Most High bestoweth upon you, show compassion and mercy without hesitation to all men, and give to every man with a good heart. And if ye have not the wherewithal to give to him that needeth, have compassion for him in bowels of mercy. Uh -huh. So, again, this is a, a instruction that we all should have. This should be our, our natural way of being. It should be quick to show compassion and mercy, right? No hesitation. If someone's in need, we should be quick to offer a helping hand. And if we're not able to offer a helping hand, again, it can be finances, it can be uh, shelter, you know, whatever someone needs. It's not saying that we always need to be in a position to provide, but if we're not in a position to provide, we should at least have compassion on the individual that's in need. Because we should understand just, just as they are in a, a lowly state, it would be an easy thing for us to be in that same state as well. So just how we would want someone to have compassion and mercy on us, we should enact that same compassion and mercy on others. All right, the next topic, topic number nine, is to stay pure. Topic number nine, again, is to stay pure. And we're going to get this example going to the Testament of Joseph. The Testament of Joseph, chapter six, we're going to read verses six through seven. Testament of Joseph, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Now therefore know that the God of my father hath revealed unto me by his angel thy wickedness, and I have kept it to convict thee, that haply thou mayest see and repent, for that thou mayest learn that the wickedness of the ungodly hath no power over them that worship the Most High with chastity. Behold, I will take of it and eat before thee. And having so said, I pray thus, the God of my fathers and the angel of Abraham be with me and ate. Uh, so for the context of this story, Joseph was being, you know, tempted by an evil woman. And the evil woman what tried to to deceitfully trick Joseph, right? Trying to try to get him to um take a potion right to, to again try to trick him and the, the angel showed joseph uh what he was doing or what, what, what she was doing but instead of joseph taking that information and then trying to use it to have shame or anything what he he kept the information so not only was joseph pure himself but he did not um he tried to keep other people pure by not spreading a bad name or bad information and we also see, we're going to see in a little bit later, he did the same thing with his brothers. But the reason why he's holding that is what? Is in hopes that why? That person that commits that evil act will eventually repent, right? So he is staying pure, and he's trying his best to keep those around him, seeing them in a pure light as well, right? Because that's what it means to be chaste. To be chaste means to be uh, clean or untouched. Right? All right, let's go to the Testament of Joseph, chapter 10 and verse 2. Testament of Joseph, chapter 10, verse 2. So ye too, if ye follow after chastity and purity with patience and prayer, with fasting and humility of heart, the Most High will dwell among you because he loveth chastity. Kind of. So again, this is Joseph basically telling us that look, if if we operate in the in the in the spirit of chastity and in in purity and cleanness, 
cleanness, you know, through fasting, right, that the Most High is going to dwell with us and no evil thing should be able to touch us. So that's the same example that we just read a moment ago when he ate the potion or he, he ate the food or drank the potion. No, nothing bad happened to him because he was protected through the purity, through his purity, the Most High decided to protect him. So that's how the state that we need to be in, staying in a, uh, a pure state of mind and understanding that through that state of pure mind, nothing evil can harm us. All right, the last testament of Joseph, chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Testament of Joseph, chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Ye see, therefore, my children, what great things I endured, that I should not put my brethren to shame. Do ye also, therefore, love one another, and with long suffering hide ye one another's faults. Huh. So again, this is the example that I was referring to. Not only was Joseph pure himself, you know, he he wasn't involved in, in evil or wicked acts. But he also did not what? He did not want to bring shame to his brothers, right? He didn't uh, share the evil actions that his brothers put on him. Why? Because he tried to keep their, their names pure, right? How? By hiding their faults. Understand that people fall. Understand that people make mistakes. But that's not for the purpose of what? Rubbing their names through the mud. Just how we want to keep our garments clean, we should want to keep uh, our brother and sister's arm is clean as well. All right, the last topic, the last topic or instruction is we need to have a good mind. All right, so the last topic or instruction is that we need to have a good mind. And when to read a, from a couple of different patriarchs to see what it means to have a good mind. The first example we're going to go to. The Testament of Benjamin. The Testament of Benjamin, chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. We only got three more uh, precepts, thanks, and then we'll, we'll be done. Again, the Testament of Benjamin, chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Testament of Benjamin, chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. And let your mind be unto good. Even as ye know me, for he that hath his mind right seeth all things rightly. Fear ye the Most High, and love your neighbor. And even though the spirits of Belier claim you to afflict you with every evil, yet shall they not have dominion over you, even as they had not over Joseph my brother. How many men wished to slay him, and God shielded him? For he that feareth the Most High loveth his neighbor, and cannot be smitten by the spirit of Belier being shielded by the fear of the Most High. Nor can he be ruled over by the device of men or beasts, for he is helped by the Most High through the love which he hath towards his neighbor. Ah. So again, Benjamin is what he's, he's recording the, the, the righteous good mind that his brother Joseph had and understanding that it was through Joseph, uh, Joseph's good mind that he was able to be shielded um, through the power of the Most High. Didn't matter what fear came across him to try to kill him or do him harm, Joseph was covered because of his good mind. All right, staying in the Testament of Benjamin, let's read chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. So now Benjamin is going to go into more detail about how that good mind is supposed to look, what, what a good mind looks like. This is the Testament of Benjamin, chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. The inclination of the good man is not in the power of the deceit of the spirit of Belier, for the angel of peace guideth his soul. And he gazeth not passionately upon corruptible things, nor gathereth together riches through a desire of pleasure. He delighteth not in pleasure. He grieveth for not his neighbor. He satieth not himself with luxuries. He erreth not in the uplifting of the eyes of the Lord in his portion. 
Shalakim. He erreth not in the uplifting of the eyes. The Most High is his portion. The good inclination receiveth not glory nor dishonor from men, and it knoweth not any guile or lie or fighting or reveling. For the Most High dwelleth in him and lighteth up his soul, and he rejoiceth towards all men always. The good mind hath not two tongues of blessing and of cursing, of contumely and of honor, of sorrow and of joy, of quietness and of confusion, of uh, hypocrisy and of truth, of poverty and of wealth, but it hath one disposition, uncorrupt and pure, concerning all men. It hath no double sight, nor double hearing, for in everything which he doeth or speaketh or seeth, he knoweth that the Most High looketh on his soul, and he cleanseth his mind that he may not be condemned by men as well as by the Most High. And in like manner, the works of Belier are twofold, and there is no singleness in them. Uh, so I know ben, ben, Benjamin went in on that one. He put a, a lot of detail. But in, in short, there's no, there's no double-mindedness. There is there is no two paths. If you're we're, we're truly to have a good mind, that means we're supposed to have a good mind about everything. We can't be we shouldn't be straddling the fence. You know, um, I have a good mind towards this, but I have an evil, wicked mind towards this. You know, I think good about this, but I think bad about this. If we're, we're if we're walking in righteousness, everything that we should do should should be in righteousness, not being hypocrites or of, of two natures, right? All right, let's go to the Testament of Issachar. The Testament of Issachar, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. This is the Testament of Issachar, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Behold, therefore, as ye see, I am an hundred and twenty-six years old, and am not conscious of any committing, of committing any sin, except my wife. I have not known any woman. I never committed fornication by the uplifting of my eyes. I drink not wine to be led astray. Thereby, I coveted not any desirable thing that was my neighbor's. Guile arose not in my heart. A lie passed not through my lips. If any man were in distress, I joined my sighs with his. And I shared my bread with the poor. I wrought godliness. All my days I kept truth. I loved the Most High. Likewise also every man with all my heart. So do you also these things, my children. And every spirit of Belier shall flee from you. And no deed of wicked men shall rule over you. And every wild beast shall ye subdue. Since you have with you the Most High of heaven and earth. And walk with men in singleness of heart. Uh, so Issachar, a very righteous example, 126 years old and, and, and passed into the bosom with, with no conscience of him committing any sin, right? He, he never committed fornication. He, he never drank wine um, or, or, or at least was never drunk, never taken away from it, right? He didn't covet. He didn't have guile. You know, or or anger. He he wasn't he didn't lie. He wasn't wasn't a hypocrite. He was okay. he showed compassion and mercy, right? So these are the righteous examples of things that we should be doing, or ways that we should be living. And if we're doing these things, then this is how we're able to avoid all of those the the the, the warnings that we listed earlier, right? All of the evil spirits that are sent from from Satan. We're able to avoid those things simply by doing what is good, simply by having the good mind. All right, but it, we're also going to see at the at the end of it all, there's still going to be a judgment, right? So if we're not being cautious and we're not being aware of the things that we're supposed to stay away from, and if we're not having a good mind, what is the judgment at the end? How will we end up, right? So we're going to get the last. Uh, Precept for the for the night is coming from the book or the apologize, the testament of Asher, chapter six, verses one through six. 
Testament of Asher, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Take heed, therefore, ye also, my children, to the commandments of the Most High, following the truth with singleness of face. For they that are double-faced are guilty of a twofold sin, for they both do the evil thing and they have pleasure in them that do it, following the example of the spirits of deceit and striving against mankind. Do ye, therefore, my children, keep the law of the Most High, and give not heed unto evil as unto good, but look unto the thing that is really good, and keep it in all commandments of the Most High, having your conversation therein and resting therein. For the latter ends of men do show their righteousness or unrighteousness when they meet the angels of the Most High and of Satan. But when the soul departs troubled, it is tormented by the evil spirit, which also it serves in lust and evil works. But if he is peaceful, with joy he meeteth the angels of peace, and he leadeth him into eternal life. Nah. So this is it, thanks. The, the last instruction is to what? To have that good mind. And that good mind is to what? It simply is just to avoid evil. Having a good mind is simply avoiding evil, fleeing from it. And if we continue to flee from evil and do what is good, uh, one, first and foremost, we're going to be protected, and the spirits will what? They will flee from us. But if we fail to do those things, if we fail to avoid the evil, if we fail to do what is, is right, and we're led by what? By our lust, then we can expect in our latter times when judgment comes that we'll be on the side of torment. And that's not what anybody wants, right? Those that have the understanding and know that it exists, we should be looking for that, that peaceful eternity, right? We want to be, be led into a peaceful habita uh, habitation, right? So with that, this concludes the lesson. I pray that it was edifying uh, and useful to you all. I, again, encourage you all to be aware uh, of what is evil and have the good mind to do what is good. Thank you for listening, and shalom.